Welcome, bienvenidos, and welcome back. We've had a chance to connect with many of you through the training and TA related to the core RFP, and now we're looking forward very much to returning to a rhythm of core coffee chats and more in-depth conversations and some new formats that we'll share with you shortly. Today's core coffee chat on exploring myths about poverty in America seems like the perfect way to return to the themes that are relevant across the core conditions, which we'll review again in a few minutes, and the equity issues that underlie them. We're very pleased to be joined today by our guest, Heather Bullock, who directs the Blum Center on Poverty, Social Enterprise, and Participatory Governance at UCSC. I'm Nicole Lesman, one of the local consultants, along with Nicole Young, who facilitates a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or CORE, Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. As you can hear, our core events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our team members, Stella Lauerman, who's providing interpretation today, and Gisela Carrasco, whose voice you're hearing now, who translates comments and questions in the chat. We'll move on to an overview of CORE. I'll turn it over to Nicole Young. Thank you. And so hopefully a lot of you know by now that CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we think of it as both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And through a lot of input and feedback from organizations like yours, uh, a couple of years ago, we drafted these mission and vision statements with equity front and center uh, in both of those statements to really remind us and keep us focused on uh, our, our purpose to inspire and ignite collective action, uh, sharing responsibility for health and well-being at every stage of life in order to get to uh, equity. And on the next slide, you'll see our, again, hopefully familiar graphic, the core conditions for health and well-being. And we use this to, again, uh, help us think about and remind ourselves about what equitable health and well-being means. That, you know, we, across the lifespan, we want to ensure that there are equitable opportunities uh, for people to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, meaning that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender identity or other characteristics or demographics. Um, and we put equity at the center of this diagram to illustrate that we have to continuously examine and address our individual, organizational and systemic beliefs and practices and structures that are often the very things that are perpetuating the inequities that we're trying to eliminate. So when we think about what it takes to create the conditions for equitable health and well-being. A big piece of that is addressing the economic inequality that it's incorporated in the systems that underlie each of these core conditions, uh, as well as the lines that connect them. That's why we're so pleased to have an opportunity to explore these themes with Dr. Bullock today. Uh, and again, you'll hear about her work and how she spent a lot of time thinking about these realities and persistent myths around poverty in one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. So we'll also have a chance to hear your ideas about these realities and myths and how they show up in your work and what you're doing to try to address them and what we could do together. Next slide. And events like this core coffee chat are offered as part of what we call the core Institute for innovation and impact. So think of the core Institute as basically like the learning arm of core investments. We offer an array of training, technical assistance and other learning opportunities for people in all types of organizations, all types of sectors, uh, with the goal of, again, building shared knowledge and skills to help us fulfill that vision of collective impact. Next slide. And so we'll show this uh, as I do a little introduction and handoff to Dr. Bullock. Um, as Nicole said earlier, Dr. Heather Bullock directs the Blum Center on Poverty, Social Enterprise, and Particip Participatory Governance at UCSC. She's also a professor in the Department of Psychology and Associate Dean of Economic Justice and Participatory Democracy in the Division of Social Science. In 2021, she teamed up with two colleagues, Mark Robert Rank and Lawrence Eppard, 
to publish a book poorly understood what America gets wrong about poverty. Uh, and even though the experience of poverty is common in American life, uh, myths and misinformation about economic disparities and opportunities are incredibly stubborn. Decades and now centuries of framing poverty as an individual problem, when the individuals need to conquer by focusing on education and hard work, also obscures potential system level policy solutions that many of us are so interested in advancing through core. So the book Poorly Understood explores these themes and more. And so that's what we're going to get to hear about today from Dr. Bullock. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions, share your comments in the chat in either English or Spanish as we go through the session. And again, we'll have a chance to uh, take some of your questions uh, and we'll have a short breakout discussion later on in the session. So Dr. Thank Bullock, you. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Good morning, it's wonderful to see all of you and thank you so much for inviting me to talk about our book this morning. Um, I'm a social psychologist by training and I have a longstanding interest in how myths and stereotypes influence social policies and the treatment of people experiencing poverty. And we wrote this book um, for one reason and one reason alone, which was to try to reach as many people as we could to debunk common myths about poverty that we encountered in our work. Next slide. I'll start by sharing two quotes that I think really ground our book. The first is by former US President John F. Kennedy. And he said, for the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And I think that may be the case for many people. Reality, especially the realities about economic injustice, can be disturbing. This is certainly the case for poverty and economic precarity. The idealized image of American society is one of abundant opportunities with hard work being re rewarded by economic security. And as a result, people who are not financially secure are often blamed or scapegoated for their situation. But what if this picture was wrong? And we make the case over and over again in this book that poverty myths, such as that there's abundant opportunity, can and do lead us to deny the realities of poverty and to prevent us from actually addressing and alleviating poverty. Next slide. This second quote is from former President Obama, Barack Obama, and in this passage, he really highlights the reality of poverty. He says, one study shows that more than half of Americans will experience poverty at some point during their adult lives. Think about that. This is not an isolated situation. More than half of Americans at some point in their lives will experience poverty. And that's a really surprising finding to many people. Next slide. This is um, just a snapshot of the table of contents from our, our book. Um, I think <laughs> we could have actually had many more chapters than we do. Um, there, are, there are more myths than we could actually get to, um, but this at least gives you a sense of, of some of the myths that we write about. And I'll say that the book is really intended as something that anyone could pick up and read and understand. Um, in all fairness, there are a lot of statistics in this book, but we've tried to make it really accessible um, and easy to understand. And we've designed each chapter to be concise and accessible. And if anyone um, wants to follow up and, and request a chapter for me, I'm glad to be able to send that to you electronically. You absolutely don't have to read the full book. And one of the chapters is available um, online, the chapter about fraud, um, and we'll provide the link for that. 
And I'll just discuss just a couple of these myths today, <clears throat> but I really want this to be a chance for a conversation and discussion about what we can do locally to challenge some of these common myths. So next slide. The first myth is really only that a small minority of Americans experience poverty or participate in public assistance programs. There are many consequences of this myth. One is the othering of people experiencing economic hardship. We think it's something that doesn't happen to many people when in fact it does. Um, it also contributes to the tendency to attribute poverty to personal or individual characteristics rather than structural factors or systemic inequalities. Next slide. The reality is much different. Life course analyses based on the panel study of income dynamics debunk this myth. There are other ways to debunk it. This is just one. But if you look across the lifespan, what you tend to find is that um, many people experience poverty. Between the ages of 20 and 35, 31.4% of the US population will have experienced poverty. By the age of 55, 45%. And by the age of 75, 58.5%. Next slide. And this, this one is a little bit um, detailed to get into here, but these are the cumulative percentages of Americans experiencing poverty across adulthood uh, by level of poverty. And if you look just at that very first column below 100% of the poverty line, you can see those statistics that 58.5% of people will have experienced poverty by the time they're 75. Next slide. This slide shows the cumulative percentage of Americans experiencing poverty, uh, I, I'm sorry, experiencing or uh, participating in welfare programs during adulthood. And it's broken down by number of years. And here what you see is that by the age of 65, 65% of Americans will at some point have resided in a household that participated in a means-tested program. Those are things like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, Medicaid, and others. And so this tells a very different story about participating in public assistance programs. And the bottom line is that, that poverty and participating in safety net programs is much more common than myths would lead us to believe. And I will point out that both of these tables focus on um, uh, the overall population. They're not broken down by race or ethnicity or gender, but the likelihood of experiencing poverty um, would be even higher if we were to look specifically um, at, at estimates that are broken down by race and gender. Next slide. Oh, um, I wanna encourage you, if you're interested in learning more or checking out um, the likelihood of experiencing poverty during the lifetime, check out the poverty risk calculator. This is an interactive tool that will allow you to put in various demographic information and see the likelihood of experiencing poverty. Um, it's, it's by my co-author, Mark Rank, um, and it's based on um, those lifetime statistics. Also, if you go to this link, you will find um, some extracted information from our book. So there are some of the myths that you can read about in more depth and also some discussion questions if you were to want to try to talk about these issues um, locally with your community. So please check out this um, really helpful website. Next slide. The next myth, and I know this is one um, that we're all really familiar with, is that with hard work and effort, poverty can be avoided. It really is that kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And there are many consequences of this myth as well. Reduce support for unemployment and public assistance programs. 
And again, that tendency to attribute poverty or economic hardship to the individual rather than systems. Next slide. Reality does not align with that myth at all. Approximately 40% of US jobs are low paying, meaning they pay less than $16 an hour. Of course, we know in our own county, a self-sufficiency wage would be much higher than $16 an hour. Many US workers are employed part-time, but want to work full-time. And it's possible to work multiple jobs and still experience poverty. So uh, hard work is not, not sufficient. Next slide. Another myth, and I think this one is really related, is that anyone can move up the socioeconomic ladder regardless of their race or ethnicity, their economic status or family background, really that there's just extensive opportunity. Unfortunately, this myth contributes to limited investment in policies and programs that can foster mobility. And again, that attribution of poverty and wealth to the individual rather than to systems or structures. Next slide. The reality is in, uh, upward mobility and opportunity are limited. Intergenerational mobility is lower in the US than in most other wealthy countries. Children's economic status as adults is powerfully influenced by parental income. It's really hard to move from the lowest to the highest income quartile. And racism and neighborhood disparities limit opportunity and restrict upward mobility. And again, if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to check out um, this website, Opportunity Insights. It provides extensive information about the likelihood of upward mobility in different communities. Um, they have all kinds of interactive breakdowns. So please check that out to um, learn more. Next slide. Another common myth, um, and maybe one of the most common, I would say, is that um, welfare fraud is uh, common, that abuse is, is common in the welfare system. This results in lower investment and support for public assistance programs and the criminalization of people who participate in those programs, things like fingerprinting and drug testing. This is just one high profile example of um, fraud. Unfortunately, stories like this have a tendency to get picked up in the media and blow up. Um, they lead people to overestimate the extent to which this is actually a problem. In this particular case, some of you may remember this, this was from a few years ago now. Um, there was a widely publicized story about uh, a man named Jason Greenslate who uh, was receiving SNAP benefits and using them to be able to not work and hang out on the beach. This is not the reality, but this story got so much, so much public attention. Next slide. The reality is welfare fraud is very scarce. SNAP primarily serves children, older adults, and people with disabilities. Nearly half of all SNAP recipients are children. And fraud and waste are minimal. They are highly tracked. Um, just one example, for every 10,000 households that received SNAP benefits in 2016, only 14 involved confirmed fraud. And most working age SNAP participants are employed outside the home, but often in unstable jobs. So really nothing like the case of Jason Greenslate, which is just highly unrepresentative. The last myth that I will discuss, um, and certainly one of the most damaging, is that poverty is inevitable, that it'll always be with us. It's just part of the fabric of our society. There's nothing we can do. Sometimes you hear um, President uh, Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty was a failure, or government programs don't reduce poverty. This clearly discourages investment in anti-poverty programs. And it encourages a kind of fatalism that change is impossible, that there's just sort of nothing that we can do. 
Next slide. The reality is poverty is human made and it's it's not inevitable. Although the war on poverty did not eliminate poverty, it was significantly reduced. From 1959 to 1973, the overall poverty rate was cut in half and child poverty was reduced as well. Another example would be social security, which has reduced poverty among older Americans. And the reality is if the US lags behind other wealthy countries in poverty alleviation, this is largely due to our lack of investment in anti-poverty programs and the absence of other benefits and supports that assist individuals and families. Next slide. And let's just go to the very last, we'll go to the next one. I'm gonna skip that one um, for the sake of time. So this is um, <laughs> this is the um, the big question: Why do poverty myths persist, and what can we do about them? It's easier to answer why they persist than to answer what we can do about them. So that's um, that's the big question. I hope we can all talk about today. I will just touch on briefly a few reasons why these myths persist. One. Um, and this is, I'm sure, one that you've thought of yourselves, is that poverty myths are sustained by a whole network of beliefs that are dominant in the United States and really central to the American dream. So that individualism, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, the belief that anyone can make it, the belief that the world is a just place where people get what they deserve. These myths are, these beliefs are so much a fabric of our culture. Um, and poverty myths are embedded and connected to those beliefs, which are very resistant to change. It's also the case that there are cognitive biases that encourage us to um, see poverty uh, and wealth as individualistic in, in those individual terms rather than in the structural. It's an easier way to process information. So there are some cognitive biases. There's extensive research in psychology that shows how resistant stereotypes are to change. Once we believe something, we really want to stick with it. And sometimes those biases are not even conscious. They can be unconscious or implicit biases. If you're interested in taking an implicit bias test, essentially this is a way to see whether um, you may carry biases yourselves, visit the implicit bias um, website. There are dozens of these implicit bias, bias tests that you can take, some about your beliefs about poverty and wealth, um, but also about uh, race, gender, and a number of other groups. It's also the case that acknowledging structural inequality can be personally threatening, psychologically threatening to people. We have a strong tendency to want to uphold the systems and believe in them. Um, and so really um, taking on and thinking about structural inequalities can be very challenging for people. It can lead them to question their own position. So we have some really strong defenses built up against doing so. And of course, these poverty myths are also based in concrete material power relations. Some groups benefit from poverty myths and from economic inequality. And so it is more than um, psychological. It is also connected to, um, to power, to material power and control. Some groups do benefit from these myths. So this is, um, I'm looking at the time, it's 10.30. Um, I promised I would only speak for 20 minutes, so I'm, I'm going to stop there. I'm really interested to hear your ideas and questions, um, both about poverty myths, um, but also about uh, how we can move forward. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. I think all of you can see the, the um, different lenses that Dr. Bullock brings to this work, and so we're eager to hear your questions now. We have a few minutes for questions, and then we're also hoping to break into some uh, smaller groups for discussion as well, then coming back together before we, we end our session today. So what questions do you have for Dr. Bullock right now before we do that? 
you can raise your hand or put something in the chat, whatever you prefer. Dr. Bullock, is this material you're using with your students at UCSC? And what kind of questions do they bring you since we're not seeing any immediately here? Oh, <laughs> I, I do teach a class on social class and poverty. Um, we talk a lot about these issues. And I think, um, you know, the, the biggest question that comes up, um, one of them is, um, how can, how can we frame poverty in different ways that can contribute to challenging that kind of almost automatic tendency um, to attribute poverty to the individual, to see it as an individual issue rather than a structural one? Um, you know, how can we find ways to do that? So I think, th I think that's, um, I think there are I think there are ways that we can do that. Um, there is research that shows that framing things um, or you know showing the humanity and the lived experience um, of, of people's lives can interrupt some of those structural those individualistic tendencies. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other questions from our group? I see a raised hand. Let's see. Go ahead, Chris. Yes, I'm wondering, I'm old enough to remember sort of the tail end of the war on poverty. And it seems like those myths were not as prevalent then, that there was still that sort of um, post-depression generation acceptance that sometimes poverty was not your own individual fault and that it was really during the 80s that that myth was um, exacerbated by people who benefited from it. Do you, is that your experience in your research? Yeah, well, I mean, I would say that, I mean, even the war on poverty was um, underfunded and not invested into the degree that you might hope. Um, but yes, I mean, I do think that the, the 80s, especially um, Ronald Reagan and the myth of the welfare queen um, really exacerbated um, the, really I would say like uh, moved us from a war on poverty to a, a war against um, poor people themselves. Uh, so yes, uh, I do think there is a shift for sure. And for people that aren't familiar th with this, um, Ronald Reagan, um, uh, you know, essentially talked about a, a hypothetical woman um, of color who was, you know, receiving benefits in twenty different under twenty different names, and um, this was really all a myth, but it it really captured public attention. And, and every time there's some kind of myth or, or case like this, like the case of Jason Greenslat, it just, it, it takes over. Um, it, it receives such disproportionate attention. Dr. Bullock, we have two questions in the chat. One is observing you know, and questioning why there's no will in, in the United States to offer free education, which has been a method in other countries to break generational poverty cycles and create opportunities. And the other is specifically about how poor nutrition and food insecurity may perpetuate cycles of poverty. I don't know if you want to quickly weigh in on those and then we'll go into our, our breakouts. Yeah, um, well, I would just say about free education. Um, there's so much that we could learn from other countries in the United States. And I think that's a great example. Um, I think we're very slow um, to acknowledge uh, the successes in other countries of alleviating poverty. Um, and the chart that I didn't show um, really kind of zooms in on that um, issue around um, benefits or assistance to single parent families and the extent to which other countries invest more and, and actually reduce poverty more. Um, and then the second question about poor nutrition. Um, yes, I mean, food insecurity is connected with to all kinds of uh, health concerns. 
um, an inability to concentrate in the classroom. Um, there are many, many health effects of, of food insecurity that further contribute to hardship, absolutely. And then we've got one for you to ponder while we're in our breakout groups. Um, Sarah's asking about if you could, with if we had political will and financial resources, where would you point those resources to, um, to influence poverty at a system level? So we'll keep everyone in suspense and we'll come back and hear Dr. Bullock's answer to that one. But meanwhile, I'm just gonna share my screen one more time here. Um, we're going to go into these breakout sessions. You'll just click to join them if you'd like to. If you don't want to, just take 10 minutes to, to think about these things. But in your groups, if you go to your, your group, just quickly introduce yourselves and then see if there's someone who's willing to volunteer to share your ideas back with the group in 10 minutes. There's an automatic timer. You don't have to do anything to come back to us, to the main room. And um, there is a group that's um, geared to Spanish speakers and bilingual participants. So if that's something that's appealing to you, you can be there. And if you have any questions, just, uh, just chat to us and we'll put the questions to ponder in the chat. What myths and stereotypes about poverty do you encounter in your own work here in Santa Cruz County? And how do you deal with those? What, how do you confront them? How do you work through them? Um, we'll come back and talk about all this in just a few minutes. Welcome back, everyone. So would anyone like to start us off? From one of our reporters, what did you talk about in your group? Some highlights for the rest of us to hear, and then we'll see if how similar or different those might have been across the groups. Who'd like to start us off? I can. Thanks. This is Sarah. Thank you. So uh, I was in a room with Susan and Stella, and we had a really rich conversation, uh, largely focused around people who are involved with justice systems. And Susan's been doing interviews and, and doing research uh, with folks who are justice involved, specifically women. So we talked a little bit about how people who are, who are in um, poverty often take on those stereotypes that were being described. Um, as individuals, they feel that. And so the the failures that they've experienced, they take on individually, and that that's part of um, that's part of the challenge that they don't necessarily see these as system system issues. And then uh, Stella also talked about this importance that we are working on system lever levers. It's important to help people, but really, when it comes to poverty, we need to step back and look at how uh, these broader these broader forces are at work. Right. Anything to add? Just that um, we really talked about sort of the generational um, perpetuation of poverty and how that people get born into those environments and then this trauma and other things that happen, they don't attribute necessarily to that. So they don't recognize the poverty as one of the influences in their experiences, but our individualism, we really talked about a lot that Heather mentioned a number of times that people take that on as it's their own fault and the language that we use particularly in the criminal legal system around accountability is really individualistic and in that in order to really understand how the systems perpetuate the harm and that it's not necessarily you know an individual can have all the determination and and hard work and all of that and it, and sometimes the structures are just insurmountable for some people and so um stella also mentioned how the the shame and self-confidence and self-esteem is all tied up in that too, which leads to self-blame and perpetuates the sense of individualism. Absolutely. Thank you all. What about another group? Kristen, were you the spokesperson for your group or Chris? We didn't designate, but we were fortunate enough to be in the breakout group with Heather. So that was really nice to have our keynote speaker with us. I, we, we had a, some interesting conversation about demographics. Okay. I work with low income seniors, um, you know, over the course of decades in Santa Cruz County in particular, the number of low income seniors keeps dropping because people are moving out of the area and not into the area the way they used to, to retire. And then um, 
Stacy, maybe you want to address, she had some really interesting information just about the Live Oak area that she works with and how her numbers get skewed in ways that aren't supportive of what she's doing because of the demographics. Yeah, I was just sharing that, and Kate can jump in on this too, um, that in Live Oak, uh, we, our school district numbers and our demographics don't um, fully reflect the actual Live Oak community. We have a very mixed demographic on um, income levels, household income levels within Live Oak, but that doesn't translate to the demographics within our schools. And I was saying that my my experience locally is very defensive because I'm very involved in our school population and that while people may have negative views and assumptions of the quality of our schools based on demographic information, um, I actually love our schools. I love Live Oak. I love being here. Um, I'm passionate, passionate advocate for it. Um, but people who don't take the time to get to know the environment and the people and the community have chosen to send their kids elsewhere. And so I have a, um, my experience with poverty is very defensive. Like uh, uh, all of the myths were dispelled for me when I became part of this community. And um, yeah, just, I, I'm, I'm not nearly as articulate as I was in our work group. I apologize, but anyways, okay. I think you probably get the sense. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thanks. Um, Pam, Patrice, what, what about your group? Hi, everybody. So I'll, I'll ask Kaki to jump in. Kaki was in my group as well. But um, we, our conversation, we kind of talked about how uh, we just kind of did an overview and a check in with ourselves about these kind of the myths and how they show up um, and a little bit about um, how we take the conversations when they show up, how we take the conversation, how can we take the conversations from interpersonal to a more um, community level to kind of start to work to dispel the myths and how woven the myths are, which makes it super tricky. Um, and something that I think about is is how these myths are supported on any in any place that you're in in American culture. These myths are supported from your viewpoint, whether you're in poverty or you're not, but they're supported at all at all levels. And so we talked a little bit about that. But I'll, I'll ask Kaki to, to jump in because Kaki had some great thoughts as well. Go ahead, Kaki. Bueno, estoy escuchando en español, entonces voy a hablar en español. Porque la... I'm listening in, in Spanish, so I'm, uh, I'll speak in Spanish. One of the cases that we talked about with Pam and Patrice was the case of hope. The, the myth about if you work hard that you'll be successful gives hope and sometimes that hope perpetuates the myth and perpetuates poverty because we're thinking, well, well, if I don't come out of poverty, it's because I'm not working hard enough. And for people who are not poor, uh, that excuses them from any responsibility from that that uh, that uh, poverty isn't an individual myth and that they don't have anything to do with that system. Thank you, Kaki. Thank you, all of you. We're, we're running a little short on time, but I'd love to hear just a, a, a snippet from the other groups. Poonam, did your group have a, or Ashley, have anything to add here? Or were you Looking at similar. Yeah, hi, this is Poonam, and uh, Ashley and I had a very interesting discussion as well. Um, again, from my question in the feed, you probably gauge that for me, it's uh, not so much about the myths around poverty. Uh, we all work in that sector. We're all trying very hard to take care of those who are disadvantaged. My question is always around why is there this level of disadvantage? Why do we have this poverty? And to give you a little context, I've lived in India and in England for a third of my life, third of my life in each of these three countries. And when I compare systems, I feel like uh, education definitely is one of the best ways to work out of the whole cycle of poverty. And 
20 years in the United States, one party or another uh, political party, I don't understand. I've lived in other systems where whatever the differences are between political parties, the welfare of their people is paramount and that is healthcare and education. I don't understand why that is so important here to divide the country rather than unite the country. And if we had those, then I think we wouldn't be dealing with the level of poverty that we have here. So anyway, this was my, because it's, it's very different from what I do on a daily basis in my nonprofit. And that was my interest to join a poverty discussion. Mm, thank Ashley, you. please yeah. add, uh, I know we, we had fun. Thank you. And the last group, um, if you had anything you wanted to add, uh, Dario, Brenda, Kate. Maybe you want to put something in the chat or. Um, yeah, or I can say a few things. I mean, I think um, our conversation did echo a lot of um, what was already said. Um, I know we did talk about kind of the myths um, of, of low-income migrant populations um, and kind of in different sections. I know I grew up in Chico, kind of Northern California, and, and they kind of view some of the poverty um, issues as more as like big city or higher income areas not so much you know up there because it's viewed differently i mean the the level of, of of housing is cheaper so there are a lot more people i guess living in trailers living in kind of more structured um areas so they view poverty slightly differently as as opposed to you know it's more of a big city thing not not so much um us or or this area here so yeah, thanks Just for that yeah and a reminder that even within these stereotypes they're specific ones for different parts of the population, different groups that are uh, pernicious in different ways. So thank you for re that reminder. And Poonam for the, the global perspective as well, and all of you for being here. I'm, I'm gonna put up our last slide about upcoming events. Um, we, as I mentioned, are, are back, trying to get back on track with, with our other offerings and Nicole will go over those with you, but just it's great to be with you today and we'll look forward to next time. And thank you, Dr. Bullock. Yes, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and so we have several events that are planned that are coming up. Um, some of them, the registration will be opening up uh, fairly soon. I actually just sent out the announcement this morning about next week's coffee chat, which is going to be, we're calling it Core and More Consulting Chat. So if any of you are consultants, thinking about becoming consultants, uh, this one's for you. We want to have uh, partly a networking and peer learning session, um, but also we're doing it as part of the Core Institute, Institute because we occasionally have a need and opportunities um, for other consultants to work with us on specific tasks and projects. So we'd love to have kind of a getting to know you meet and greet session next week. And then we're also trying out some different formats. Um, we'll send more information about this, but we're trying out a, what we're calling a learn, do, share type of learning event in the Core Institute where Nicole and I are gonna be participating in a webinar uh, led by the Stanford Social Innovation Review on how to tell visually impactful stories with data. We wanna invite a handful of people to do it with us, be part of a little learning community, put it into practice and then co-present or uh, share at an upcoming Core Institute event like this with others who might be interested in learning some of the techniques uh, that you've used, that you've learned for sharing data, telling stories. So we'll, uh, again, send more information about that. And then um, the save the date for May 3rd, that date might actually change, uh, may, might need to be scheduled, rescheduled, uh, but that'll be an opportunity to explore some more on Data Share Santa Cruz, some health and wellness indicators. And then we're working on planning a kind of a budget 101, understanding the county budget process that will be co-presented with the County of Santa Cruz staff and co-hosted by the Human Care Alliance and Nonprofit Connection Santa Cruz County. Uh, and that'll be partly kind of an informative workshop and uh, some discussion. So keep an eye out for those registration announcements as they come out. And I think that's it for today. So we'd like to 
Uh, for those of you that are still here, if you wouldn't mind filling out the brief sur feedback survey, we always really appreciate uh, feedback about the sessions and the structure and the content. We do pay attention to the feedback and try to continuously improve based on it. Can I say one last thing, one last word? Yes. I didn't, you. thank you so much to everyone. I didn't get to answer, I think it was Sarah's question. Um, I'll just say that I'm a, a giant optimist and I do believe change is possible. And I think that um, there is a lot of political will for change right now around universal income, raising wages and many other things. So um, I'm very optimistic. That's such a great note to end on. So thank you for that. And um, we just appreciate everyone being here and to, to uh, justifying Dr. Bullock's optimism in the future. Thank you. <laughs>